Hi guys and welcome back to the For You channel. Now in this video I've got a very special guest. I would love for you all to help me welcome Karen Bosher who is one of the MDs from Green King, a pub and brewery chain that we all know and love. Hello Karen, how are you? Hello there Tim, I'm fine, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, very well. Now 2020 has been an unbelievable year for us all, uh, especially for pubs. Uh, who'd have thought that come March we'd all be locked down for months and months, then told that we can go and eat out to help out, and now we're back at the moment of filming in a second lockdown. What's it been like for you and at Green King? Oh, gosh, if you'd have said to me uh, a year ago that we'd be in this position, I never, ever would have believed you. But um, thankfully, um... oh, no. I froze again. <laughs> You're still live. We can still hear and see oh. you absolutely fine, Karen. I'm sorry, my fr <laughs> screen's freezing a little bit. Oh, I'm just so used to trauma these days. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you'd said to me a year ago that we would be in this position, I never would have believed you. Um, but it's a good job that pub people generally are very optimistic, uh, happy, lively people. And I, you know, I think no matter what. Um, life's throwing at us everybody's kind of going again and going again so there's a lot of resilience in the team and um they're sort of showing their best side at the moment well i for one certainly am missing the pub don't for me there is nothing better than the good old traditional pub where you can go in there and get a good pint sit down somewhere nice and comfy and being good company uh, but there's more to pubs than just that, isn't there? I mean, they, they are very important parts of the community, aren't they? Yeah, indeed. And I think that this is coming into stark sort of focus now um, as people realise what it's like to have life without the pub. So I would say this, wouldn't I? Because I obviously head up quite a lot of pubs and um, we're definitely seeing that the love, the appetite for the pub is not diminished. Um, I think on the first lockdown, you know, we were talking a lot about the fact that pubs really hadn't closed even during the war. You know, they'd managed to stay open. So this shutdown of some of these sites was unprecedented particularly in central London um, and there was a real sort of uh, sense of uh, camaraderie and you know everything that we could achieve during that first lockdown I think then you know coming bringing the pubs back and it was a very emotional day when we shut the pubs so bringing the pubs back was very emotional and a huge job actually uh, I don't think uh, when the government are talking about uh, opening and closing pubs at short notice and um, for short short windows as they are at the moment they realize quite what's in involved in terms of reopening uh, a business of that type um, but you know when we had to go a second time we sort of went at it gung-ho um, so we put an awful lot of effort into a program called pub safe whilst we were shut got that program sorted out because we knew that one of the you know the key considerations was going to be safety and and the ability to come into the pub still feel safe still enjoy the types of social occasions that people had before around families around gathering and around sports Sport, you know is particularly important to us um, so we put a lot of work in so then to be faced with um, mass lockdown again was um, a bit of a, a bit of a blow really given the fact that we weren't seeing high levels of track and trace um, we were we, we had our pubs under control uh, we knew that we weren't getting transmission in the pub environment um, and therefore you know all of hospitality was being treated the same and um, and that wasn't necessarily indicative of what we were experiencing in terms of traceable events that were happening in the businesses but to your, to your point about the occasions in the pub yes you know certainly we are very dependent on blokes who like beer um, but there are lots of different types of pubs now around the family occasions some more food-led pubs I mean I run a company called or one of the companies I run is, a, is the Metropolitan Pub Company in central London, which is a gastro um, food company. And, um, you know, and people enjoy very different styles of social occasions in those environments that are still very accessible, um, not threatening. You know, you can bring your nan, you can bring your kids, you can bring your dog uh, and everybody's welcome. And I think that's why the British public really love the pub is that they don't feel that it's pretentious or something that... Uh, that everybody can't enjoy and I think we've tried we've worked really hard over the years to make sure that that is that is the case mm. I guess I pubs have moved on from what they used to be you know you can think about like these 
almost grotty little drinking holes where it's all like the only thing you can get in there is either mild or bitter and maybe some crisps and so <laughs> forth, you know, and, and everyone's got their favourite seat and, you know, how dare you sit in Dave's place in the pub kind of thing, you know. I remember when I was growing up, I worked behind a bar for a, not very long, but I remember working behind the bar. It was it was the pub that I always went to drink and ended up just sort of going behind the bar when it was busy because they trusted us and then started being paid to be behind the bar. And there was sort of like the lounge at the back, which is where yeah. me and all our friends used to go and sit because we, we liked to just sit and you know, be nice and quiet and drink and talk and maybe play a couple of games of cards or whatever. And, th and then yeah. there was sort of like the, the bar at the front, which was, far more loud and leery and where the football was and so on and so forth. And that was it. You know, there was those two parts of the pub. Whereas, you know, you go, you go into like a pub now and there's still sort of like a bar area. There's still sort of yeah. that drinking place, but there's a lot more food, you know, and there, there's families there. It's where it's almost like the pub has matured. Yeah, well, I think pubs always reflect society and what's going on in society at that point. So, you know, people say to me about historic pubs, but my quote on that is history is created today. So what we're doing today in pubs um, will be its informed history in hopefully 100, 200 years time. And they'll be talking about the things that we did. So, you know, I've I've hosted and, and been party with my management team to some amazing events that if you'd said to us, is that what a pub does? Um, I never I never would have believed them. I personally still really enjoy going into those authentic old fashioned style boozers and mm. uh, seeing the old guys that sit by the fireplace and have gone there for 60 years. And, um, you know, you find them, um, they still exist. And there's a sort of an, a real authenticity about them. I think that's really reassuring. But yeah, you're right. The, the, you know, it's a very broad church now, the pub spectrum. And it, it is much more about general hospitality. And, you know, we've got a lot of pubs. Green King has 2,700 pubs in the UK. Wow, and I didn't so you know we've got that many. Yeah, we've got that many. And we're wow. sort of, in some occasions, we're tripping over ourselves. You know, we've got we've got so many pubs. So what we really want to do there is make sure every pub is um, sort of serving a purpose for that community that is relevant, mm. that we have occasions that are suitable. And in some cases, that will be a, a liquor-only drink pub uh, that's really based around sport and um, and great beer, um, right the way through, as I said, to more food occasion businesses or family friendly businesses um, that uh, you, you feel you can take the whole family to on Sunday for a roast and, and you know, kick your heels back and not have to worry about the washing up. So mm -hmm. you know, I think it has it has matured in development. And I think that that is really reflective of society and I think now our responsibility is to invent through the current crisis new occasions so that people still see the pub as being a safe and relevant uh, place to go and spend their free time uh, when when they're not doing other stuff so Definitely. you know hopefully that will be a good thing that will come out of all of this craziness I hope so now can we take a step back I, I love that quote that history is made today um, mm. let, let's go back to the start of the year, because I remember the start of the year when, you know, there was murmurs of COVID, there was yeah. talk of it, there was sort of a fear, and then it arrived in Italy, and it's all like, okay, it's in Europe now, this is really starting to, you know, almost knock on our door, and mm. then it was, I, yeah, everyone was like, we're going to go in lockdown, we're going to go in lockdown, and then it did hit. Are you able to share with me um like what those few days were like back in you know the start of the year around february march time when mm. um this news broke and when you know the boris johnson did stand there and say right we're going into lockdown this means bum 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 are all going to be closed and so forth what yeah. what was it like in the you know at that kind of level at green king yeah it was um <sighs> calm crisis is the way i would describe it. i don't think anybody could really believe what was unfolding before us we were to some extent prepared we are you know we're a large company and we do we were looking at the international trends um ahead of this time so probably around november time yeah. we said look you know we're going to have to start making provision for home working and we were getting some indicators and we we do a lot of insight work at green king so the insight data the international trends on this were starting to sort of creep into our conversations um i think then when we were faced 
absolutely at the, sort of the door of it happening. And I think the realization of it was that um, a couple of us in the board team got COVID. We we got it. I had it. Wow. So we we actually got ill and um, uh, not in the pubs, but I, I actually went to Twickenham and picked it up at Twickenham, I think. I think that's what happened. So myself and my family all had it. So then it starts to become really real because, you know, you can see that there is, you know, it's going to affect your family and things like that start to happen. So we um, we went into very practical mode. Um, you know, it was always about the care for the team, you know, sustaining the business um, as long and as securely as we can. So the long term sustainability of the business is always at the front of, of all our considerations, whilst really caring for our guests and um, and our and our teams. And I think then, you know, we were getting into really big decisions around things like PPE, about thinking about how we shut the businesses down for the first time. So, you know, the haul back of beer was quite a big debate. You know, that's we, we did that in a really environmentally and safe way, not only for our own managed businesses, but for the pub partners businesses as well. But that was a massive job and getting the beer out of this, getting kegs out of drops and the drop is the cellar way the beer goes down in London pubs, almost impossible to do. But we were pretty determined not to throw the beer down the drain and cause sort of a hazard. Um, and therefore, um, you know, we made a commitment about us. We've got we've got a real big agenda around sustainability uh, and we didn't want to compromise that. So it was about how do you get rid of the waste food? How do you get rid of waste beer? How do you protect the team was the, was front of mind. And obviously we were fighting very, very hard for the furlough terms at that point. Mm. So uh, Nick, I think with the industry, the various industry forums that exist and the leaders of lots of pub companies really came together at that point and I think did um, a stunning job of lobbying government about what it would take to, in order for us to be able to shut the businesses down and try and preserve what are some very historic and, you know, important community assets. You know, when you think about well-being, you don't necessarily think about, about pubs, mm. but you know, they do actually. They are a service provider in the community, and that became very apparent when we started to say we were going to close. You know, there's issues around loneliness, gap places where people gather. We had weddings booked, we had funerals booked. You know, it was just uh, we just had to navigate all the way through it. Mm. And what we did practically was we we just went into a different way of working completely so we collapsed our whole internal structure we created um, project three three key project teams I headed up um, with the brand directors the initiation of the pub safe mechanic looked at how we would operationalize that through the business we then had another managing director who was accountable for shutting the pubs and another managing director there's five of us in total but three that run run the managed side and another managing director that was accountable for communication and opening businesses back up so we were already thinking about how we we're going to reopen when we were closing, if you like, because that was uh, that was as big a job as anything. So, I bet. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 it's not uh, when you see like a, a pub on isolation. Like it's it's not as simple as you walk up to it, you lock the door, and walk away from it. As you say, there's there's food stuff, mm -hmm. there's beer in the cellar, there's you know refrigerators that need to be kept running and kept serviced. There's mm -hmm. spaces that need to be kept clean and you know security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you've got yeah. nearly three thousand pubs. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got teams within those pubs. I mean, how many how many people did this impact at Green King? We've got forty four thousand employees that directly work for the business, um, and that's without the people that work for our pub partners, uh, mm. tenancies for the business. So you know, an enormous uh, workforce, and you know, also a, a team. A lot of them live in on the premises. So um, you know, you also have then the complication of um, a lot of people that had considerations for overseas workers, maybe their their naturalised countries weren't uh, the UK, so they were worrying about things were unfolding in Italy, in Spain, wanting to get back, wanting to make contact. Uh, Eastern European uh, team members wanted to go home, uh, but live in. Um, so how are we going to handle that? How do you handle an outbreak in a premises where you maybe had mixed accommodation? Uh, you know, in central London alone, we have 1,400 live-in team members mm. so the logistics are enormous but the team did a phenomenal job and actually you know operationally uh they just showed they were 
you know an amazing team at that point because everybody went into a, into this formation they didn't have to be asked twice we put most people on furlough um, mm. but 300 uh, and that includes the brewery um stayed out of furlough just to keep the business maintained and then reopen it at the other side and how did the teams feel like when oh. so before all of these measures were were put in was there unease and rest with the teams or were they looking to you for guidance and advice what what were they like i think you do go into quite a parent child relationship at that point i think people become very dependent they want clarity i think the learning in all of this was that in crisis like really big crisis like this um they just want real clarity absolute honesty you know real time information and you just can't communicate enough you know it's communicate 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 and if you think you've communicated communicate again uh, and we were trying to find ways to talk to them about um sort of practical day job issues how do you shut your pub down how do you maintain team? how do you pay your team how are we going to allow you to pay your team and uh, we were doing a lot of top-ups and um you know looking after them in, in quite a big way at that point we were able to um and uh you know they became very dependent very quickly um but at the same time there was this whole other bit which was about they wanted social contact because they are very sociable people we've got quite a lot of managers living on premises on their own uh, and we were very conscious you know being in a big old building like a pub and you're, you're on your own it's not a nice sort of situation to be in particularly if you're in the city mm. so we, we then to embark on a number of initiatives around social occasions, quizzes. You know, we, we had a, a, a pub quiz group that was enormous in the end. Um, and I think every line manager sort of took accountability for staying in touch with their team and, and trying to manage the sort of the mental health awareness, you know, making sure people felt that they were still in contact with the, with the business. And we, we're, we're lucky because we've got an internal social channel called kingdom uh, where everybody can post the same as they would on facebook or um, instagram and um, we were able to push lots of really engaging content competitions uh, and keep people feeling that they were in touch with the organization you know so they didn't feel all corporate and businessy mm -hmm. there were other angles to that to that contact and communication which turned out to be really really valuable to people's well-being i think and how do you think they're feeling now Obviously, we've been through a lockdown, then we opened up, and now we're at this moment in time back in, a, in the second lockdown as we're, as we're coming up towards Christmas, the first ever COVID Christmas, hopefully yeah. the one and only COVID Christmas. Yeah. Um, how are they feeling now? I think second lockdown has been different. Um, I think it has been tougher. I think, you know, the, the time of year hasn't helped. Um, and I think that sense of if people struggled on the first lockdown, um, the reopen was sort of like, all oh, right, we're through that now. We don't have to face that again. So then for some people that really did find that period isolating and difficult, the notion of going again on that was really, really tough. Um, so, you know, we put a lot of markers out to say, you know, if you think you're going to struggle through this, um, let's start working with you now to help help you through that. Mm -hmm. And I think then, you know, the fact that it's winter, the days are shorter, the, you know, your ability to go out and do those walks on rainy days are, are gone. Uh, people are stuck in a bit more. I think that's not very helpful. Um, and also, I think people are really starting to worry about financial hardship, long longevity of their um, career prospects. They're worrying about those things mm. in a very material way because I think they know the longer the things go on the harder it becomes to keep the business um, sustainable so mm -hmm. um, you know, those are very real and practical considerations and they're pushing quite hard on the business to say can you give us surety can you give us guarantees and you know as a leadership team we're just doing our best to navigate through it and give them as much real time uh, information as we can bearing in mind that directives are coming quite late from government and you know we understand that you know they're, they're also further up the tree sort of making those imperative decisions based on health and economics so you know we we um we have to be respectful of that um but the team are looking for surety that sometimes we can't can't always give them mm. when they need it mm. so i think yeah, i think it is feeling a, a little bit more turgid this second second time around and can I ask overall for, for your business, has um, has there been any change in, in size overall? Have, have any pubs that have closed been unable to reopen or have you managed to maintain the same size? 
Um, I think long term, all the businesses will reopen. We have um, taken, I run a, a, a division called Premium Urban and Venture Brands, which is the city centre businesses and as, and as described, the more premium businesses in Green King. Um, and um, we've had about 20 businesses that we've effectively mothballed until next March, mm -hmm. which means that without 100% capacity management, um, we couldn't justify reopening them at this point. Um, but at the point where um, we do return to 100% uh, capacity, um, all, all those businesses are viable and very viable. You know, some of those businesses are very profitable businesses for Green King. So, you know, um, out of that's 400 pubs. So it's a very small proportion that have been unable to reopen through COVID. Um, but longer term, all of them will, you know, will be reopened is, is our expectation. That's good news. That is fantastic news to hear. Um, what do you feel the overall emotions are within the pub and brewery industry? How how are your colleagues and you know your your friends and so forth within the industry? How are the, what's the feeling within the industry beyond Green King? I think it's very mixed because clearly it depends on your financial. Um, stability and you know how much reserve you've got to get through what could be a protracted period of time you know as i keep explaining to the team we're not doing a sprint here we are doing a marathon we've got to you know provision our resources accordingly i don't think everybody has um sort of the benefit if you like of of that security and therefore i think you, you know you're seeing a lot more alarm particularly with the entrepreneurs people who really put their necks out and they're very important to the pub economy because mm -hmm. you know we rely on those people that are really really at the sharp end of innovation to drive the new thinking the pub economy um sort of the freshness that 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 whole part of the, the the hospitality spectrum brings so if those people are lost in this crisis it's going to leave a massive hole um in terms of how we evolve as a as an industry so i think you know you're seeing um those guys probably and those that are sitting on leaseholds probably most um sort of most exposed at this point and, and most concerned so i think it I don't think anybody's escaping worry. I think we're all worried and concerned because your business is not open. And, you know, I think the mistake is that people think that just because you're shut, you're not burning through cash. We are burning through cash mm. even in, as we're shut down. It costs us money to be closed. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the sooner we can get the businesses reopened. And, we, you know, we felt genuinely we had done a really good job of providing a different social occasion around visiting the pub that was safe, uh, and, you know, the, the statistics on that bore that out. So I think in addition to the worry, I think there's just a huge amount of frustration that the industry is to some extent being pulled out as a barometer. I was listening to uh, um, the Chancellor on, um, on, on the TV this morning and, you know, within three minutes of the interview they were talking about hospitality and pubs reopening as part of this next phase of reopening so it's really front of the conversation every time people are talking about covid they're saying you know protect the nhs our pub's going to reopen yeah. and that seems to be the, the sort of currency for how well or poorly um we're doing on this whole thing mm. and, well, um, yeah. i think that's a little unfortunate really well, like yourself, I also work in hospitality industry as a freelance presenter. And in 2020, I had something like 40 odd events booked. And in the end, well, there's yeah. no events now running to, to December, no outdoor events, which is what I mainly do. I think in total, yeah. I did about six events, six out of 40 odd events. You know, it's, it's a huge, huge difference. But I've still got all of my outgoings as usual, you know, paying for you know, technology, yeah. paying for kit, paying for a website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is still going out. Um, but I'm still not putting yeah. any money, so like in my bank, to pay for my mortgage or to keep a roof over my head and food on the table. So, yeah, it, no. it, it's it's very challenging within the hospitality industry, whether yeah. that is you are a venue or a pub or whether you are a supplier yeah. or provider to that industry. It has a huge impact. Um, yeah. Speaking of, of personal impact, can I go back to, um, back to yourself, Karen, and, and ask you what your experience of COVID was like? What, what the illness or yes or, or, no that the illness because obviously you yeah. contract it from you said when a visit from from Twickenham what yeah. I'm, I'm I don't think I've spoken to anybody yet on an interview on this channel who has actually had 
COVID. So what yeah. talk to me about your first hand experience of this horrific disease. Mm-hmm. It's highly unpleasant. I wasn't hospitalised and I actually worked through it from home. So I was doing lots of Zoom calls and um, uh, kind of maintaining that sort of thing. So I think I was sort of um, lucky in inverted commas uh, versus some some individuals. Um, But uh, yeah, you know, it's just like nothing you've ever experienced before. I think when people say I've had COVID and then they start to describe flu, um, it's, it's not that. So, you know, real really feeling very tired i think was is the first sort of signal high temperature um uh, dehydration and you know there's a that kind of continues and the big thing was this taste and smell thing which we experienced my daughter actually had it uh, first and she said i can't taste or smell anything and at this point this was not a an identified symptom uh and then we all had a loss of taste and smell and so and i still have that problem now you know that's ongoing mm. um and uh yeah that was the most alarming thing because you, you know that's never happened before so you do then feel quite panicked um and um and you worry and at that time you could see that more people were going to hospital i don't think the treatment processes were well mm. established at that point so your alarm was something more you'd go into a more significant phase of it and then you know what was going to happen from there and i actually lost one of my best friends to covid um so you know somebody who was reasonably healthy in his late 50s not got a history of any sort of significant underlying health issues and that then really makes it a very stark reality when you lose somebody close to you i'm so sorry Um, no, I, well, you know, it's happened and, you know, what can you do? Lots of people have lost people. But I think then, what does that bring you? You know, because I'm quite an optimistic person. What does it bring you? It really made me very conscious of other people's safety. I think when we were looking at the Pub Safe program and how on earth do you open up an environment where you might expose people to cross infection i was very sensitized i suppose to that so with good heart i couldn't have done anything or made any recommendations that i didn't think were um not going to be uh, a real sort of barometer of how do we keep create a safe safe social experience uh, i i felt very satisfied that my experiences to some extent put me in good stead to understand social distancing to understand how you might protect yourself in a pub environment mm. um i wouldn't wish it on anybody if, no, who would who would yeah. thank, so, thank uh, you yeah. for sharing that quite personal experience and again i'm so sorry to hear about your about your friend that's that's really yeah. horrific i'm very sorry about that um yeah. just thinking now towards uh towards sort of a, a closing questions here for you Karen. and talking there about your experience and how you you implemented that experience into moving forward and and actually implementing that side within what you were doing within the business from your experience of the last 12 months what would be your advice your your tips anything that you've learned from say the experience of covid and 2020 that you'd like to share uh with people who are watching this video right now whether they are you know they could be a member of the public who are used to going to one of your pubs it could be somebody who works in a pub whether it is a green king pub or not it could be somebody who's just you know working generally it could be a manager or a very senior manager like yourself um or it could literally just be as i say a member of the public thinking towards the christmas period and what that could potentially look like so what would be your advice any tips any tricks from this year Oh, gosh. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I'm remaining optimistic that the pub industry will be open of a fashion from uh, the second from the second or the third. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the date start when the start date will 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 commence. And I would say that, you know, it's, a, it's your safety, your personal safety is your accountability and you know what your thresholds are. So if you're in a high risk category, if you're a shielder, if you if you're, uh, you're more mature, you're a bit older, uh, then you've got to take going into any social situation carefully. However, um, you know, what I would say is, you, you know, you still, you, you can find safe socialising out there. Not every pub is the same, but you, when you walk towards a business, if there's a host at the door, if they're asking you to um, uh, scan a, a QR code when you come in, if you feel that they're managing capacity responsibly, if they've got 
mechanics in there to avoid people moving around in that business, then that's probably as safe a social situation as you're likely to find. Uh, safer than going to lots of other open areas or mixed congregation areas where those protocols aren't in place. And I think, you know, from a leadership point of view, what I'd say is always look for the brilliance, try and be optimistic. I think there's so many amazing things that have happened through this experience, and this is completely off piece, but I was looking this morning, um, you know, part of our mantra at Green King is um, pouring happiness into lives. We talk about that a lot, about this happiness factor. And I was reading that uh, I'm from a place called Gower down in South Wales originally. And there's a group of women down there that go in the sea every day called the Rother Bobbers. And they wear big flowery caps and everything. And they, they're jumping around in the sea um, every morning. And they're mature. Let's just say they're mature. They're probably the same age as me. Right? <laughs> And they managed to get onto the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And these photographs, if you can look them up, it's by a lady called Joanne Randalls. Look up these pictures. They're in the Sunday Times and they're also in, in the Wall Street Journal. The sheer happiness and joy of getting into the sea together, being happy, finding those moments that are really uplifting. I think there's been so much connectivity in society. And this is why I feel very passionately that pubs you know, need to come back because I think people will find it here. They'll find those connections and then, you know, enjoy, you know, that those social occasions, but also the sort of the giving back moments, you know, those moments when you can do something for somebody else. You know, I know, you know, it's really important that pubs are open on Christmas Day because we do service a lot of uh, loan uh, elderly people with Christmas dinners and things like that we make sure they've got a sense of place when they would otherwise be on their own and I think that the pub being there is is really important and you know I think the other thing is you know plan your contingencies because in the event that doesn't happen um, you know you, you're going to need to reach out and find different ways of making yourself feel fulfilled by having your own sort of connection of the people and I think you can do an awful lot from giving back and whether you can financially give back is one thing but giving back if you've got time on your hands and I'll give it back give it back to somebody else that's going to really make a difference and I think there's so many examples you know Green King raised a million pounds uh, over a million pounds I think it was 1.1 million pounds for Millen in September uh, it's the most we've ever we've we've ever raised on a single campaign, and to achieve that at a time when people are feeling real sort of bites of hardship, it was all about the managers and the teams giving their time. Yeah. Um, and I think that that sense of purpose and wanting to give back to communities and society was at an all time high in adversity. So um, I think that gave them their lift. I think that gave them their purpose, that it gave them their, their buzz. So, you know, if I'm ever in a position to advise anybody else, find your happiness, be a productive person, give back, and, um, and, and you know, we'll get through this and keep coming to the pub. Go to the good pubs. Absolutely. Go, go to the good pubs. I'm, I was going to say, it's a tradition to go to the pub on Christmas Eve, and I'm determined to uphold that tradition again this year, whether I have to host my own virtual pub at home. Um, Karen, yeah. thank you so, so much for joining us on the For You channel and for giving up some of your time and some of your personal experiences and advice. It's very, very much appreciated. Now, if you enjoyed this video, guys, please remember to hit that subscribe button and give this video a like. We've got loads more content coming up on the channel as well over the coming weeks and months. Once again, Karen, thank you very much for your time again today and thank you for watching this video. As always, stay safe and we will see you again very soon.